Hi, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers, the show where we dig a little bit deeper to understand what's really important in business. I'm your host, Dave Bookbinder, and today we're going to be talking private equity with my guest, Thomas Lindbergh of Upstream Capital. Thomas, thanks so much for joining us today. David, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be my here. My pleasure. Let's get right down to it. Sure. So, you're uh, a former investment banker yes. working with companies on the sell side in the M&A world. Yes. And you made a transition into private equity. I did. Tell us about that transition and Upstream Capital. Sure. So my partner and I, Christina Novicki is her name. Uh, she's in Boston. I'm here in Philadelphia. And um, long and short, as she started uh, Upstream about coming up on four years ago, she was at a healthcare focused private equity firm um, for about God, maybe 12 years. and. Um, I had known her for quite some time uh, through my father, actually, who was in the healthcare business. I got to know her very much mentor mentee type relationship. She was helping me get back into the Philadelphia market uh, with some interviews, making phone calls, whatever she could do to try to help me. Uh, and when I made the decision, I wanted to kind of leave banking, go to the buy side, and then also move back to Philadelphia. Um, and as that process was going on, she was helping along uh, as best she could. And then almost at the 11th hour, said, um, you know, I'm going to leave Med Equity, I'm going to start my own firm. And, uh, I think you should come with me. And I said, what the heck? At the time, I was 26, uh, no liabilities. I wanted to get back to Philly. It was a great chance uh, not only to get back there, but also to do uh, buy-side work. Um, and it was pretty binary. It's a little riskier um, you know, path than the, than the traditional route. But I thought, you know, down the road, I'm going to kick myself if I don't take this opportunity. And I knew she was going to be successful no matter what. Um, and I would have absolutely kicked myself had I not taken the chance. Uh, and worst case scenario, it's pretty binary. Either you know, eight months into it, a year into it, we either buy our first company or we don't. Right. So there's really no gray area. Uh, knowing that, I said, even if it doesn't work, um, I've got a great story to tell to whichever firm I want to go back and interview with, business school, you name it. Um, so that's the background on how we, how we started. We'll get into the strategy in a second. But um, you know, we bought our first company in April 2016. Um, you know, we've, we've done two add-on acquisitions with that business since, and um, you know, our, our strategy we think is very different from your traditional private equity group. Um, we bring a lot different type of capital to the table, um, a different type of feel and strategy, and um, you know, we, we've had a really good uh, run so far. It's been four years, I can't believe it. But um, yeah, with some good luck along the way, it's, uh, it's been a great journey. Excellent. I'm glad that worked out for you. you Thank you. a good risk and it, and it paid dividends for you. It did. And we're going to dive into what makes you guys unique and like sure. you talked about strategy. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's go there for a little bit now. Um, when we last spoke, you mentioned something about being on what you call the last frontier of investing. And when yeah. I typically think of a private equity investment in a company, I think that a company has to be of a certain size, maybe revenues and profitability. What, what's the last frontier? Sure, so if you think about it on, on really the bell curve, the lower middle market, your traditional under 200 million in revenue um, is, is kind of the you know, textbook uh, size for a business like that. Then you've got the lower middle market, which is your, you know, has been you know, hot as a piston for the last, call it, 20 years, which typically is between, call it, three million of earnings or EBITDA to, you know, call it 25 or 30 million. But underneath that 3 million, there's tons of businesses that are great companies that almost get overlooked. Um, and the other side of that is the startup world or the venture world, right? Either whether it's in Palo Alto, whether it's on, you know, which has now been a booming venture market both in Philadelphia, New York, you name it, Boston, for example. Um, there's this middle ground that's, you know, anywhere between 300,000 and call it two and a half, three million dollars of EBITDA or earnings are these great companies all up and down the East Coast where we look, but uh, across the country that nobody really has paid attention to. And they've almost said, you know, you're either not big enough, um, you have too many operational inefficiencies, you don't really look like a portfolio company that we want to invest in. Um, and not that they've been overlooked, but a lot of times you can find some great companies, the diamonds in the rough, and those are the ones that we are really attracted to, um, and owner-operators that have had this company, you know, maybe for 20 years, sometimes 30 years, or have built it out of the recession, so maybe only 10 years. Um, those are the kind of companies that we look for, um, and it's been not overlooked, but underinvested, certainly. Yeah. Uh, you're seeing more private equity groups, we think, go downstream. Um, you know, not, not, that's not where we got our name from, upstream, but... <laughs> Um, you know, it, those kinds of companies that typically either are shied away from for, by your traditional private equity group. Um, you know, for example, if you've got five criteria, they might meet three, but the other two are causing them to you know, say, hey, call us in a couple of years. We don't want that. We want to talk to them right now. We want to talk about partnering with them right now. And that last frontier of the lower, lower, what we call the micro end of the market, 
Um, not that they're small companies, um, obviously a million dollars or even a half million of earnings is nothing to sneeze at, but that size business, the micro end of the lower middle market is where we want to play, which is where we think um, a lot of companies have been overlooked for years. Yeah. And so if, if you're a traditional business owner, mm -hmm. and you've got this mindset that uh, I'm too small for private equity, maybe I'm never going to be big enough for private equity. Sure. Um, it's important that they know who you are, and obviously this program is part of getting that message out, but how do people you know, figure out how to reach out to somebody like yourself? Sure, so I've got a LinkedIn page. Um, you know, ha feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I guess we can put my uh, email and phone number up. Uh, we've got a website that we just launched. Uh, we have the domain upstreamcapital.com. We're in the process of, of getting our website loaded to that, but we have a Wix website that we've built where my partner and I have information on there. You can send us a message through the website, uh, through LinkedIn, phone call, email. Um, at the end of the day, the best thing for me, I was raised by a father uh, who built two companies and was in sales for the last 30 years, and he said, uh, phone call is always the best. So right. please feel free to give me a call at any time, um, email, whatever works. But, Sounds uh, yeah, good. That's the best way. We've got to take a quick break, pay a few bills. We'll be right back with Behind the Numbers after these commercials. TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company's brand awareness. But what is your brand? According to Forbes, it's a combination of your logo, your product, your design and feel, and your personality. Did you know that aside from being a guest, we offer even more opportunity to boost your brand? Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine ad, you can leave our studio and within 48 hours have a permanent digital copy of your live segment to link to your social media, embed into your company website, or use in email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest. Hi everyone, welcome back to Behind the Numbers. We're talking private equity today with my guest, Thomas Lindbergh. And Thomas, this show is called Behind the Numbers. Yep. And when you and I were talking about your first investment, um, it, it struck me as an interesting um, way to approach the whole concept for the show because they literally had no numbers. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, no, it, uh, so the first business that we acquired, uh, great company based in Bayshore, uh, Long Island, New York. Uh, they distribute home medical supplies and durable medical equipment. It's called OJ MedTech. Um, and the gentleman that we bought the business from, uh, when we first got in and started doing our diligence, uh, we realized very quickly that they don't have an accounting software, and uh, it was all manual accounting. Uh, they didn't count their inventory, and they were on cash base, which is nothing wrong with that. But then, um, for our sake, to make matters worse, they didn't uh, calculate their cost of goods sold. So we had to basically go in and synthetically create the cost of goods sold, and then also have a firm come in and uh, help us move it from cash to accrual. Um, so again, a lot of these things that are kind of unsexy pieces of lower middle market, micro market businesses, it's a great company. Cash flows like crazy. Um, it's been very successful for us so far. But I mean, I don't know one private equity firm that would go in if they weren't on an accounting software, didn't even know what their gross margins were, and would say, yes, let's do this deal. We jumped on it in a heartbeat. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we love. And those are the diamonds that we look for. Yeah, it's a great story. Clearly, you guys saw something there that was unique. Yeah. And in the first segment, you alluded to you know, being a different type of private equity firm. Sure. And we were talking at the break, you mentioned something about flexible capital. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so our, we think our differentiator is almost twofold. First, for the business owners, and then for the, uh, the investors that we have, our partners. Um, first side on the investor side is we're, we don't have a committed fund. So we're not looking for you know, checks up front to, to raise the money into a satchel and then go invest on a strategy. We raise the money for companies that we want to buy on a deal-by-deal -deal basis or add-on acquisitions for existing portfolio companies. Um, we do that for a couple reasons. First off, we realize that... Um, more business owners, executives, high net worth individuals and families, the network that we pull from, want to have almost an a la carte type uh, offering of businesses that they do invest in. They don't just want to invest in a strategy. While there always will be the market for the traditional private equity firm and fund, 
we don't want to try to be that. What we want to be is the alternative to the alternative. So they can have input on which company specifically they invest in with us. And then on top of that, we want to have them come help us grow the business with the executive and the operator that we're backing. So not only do they have tangible input on the outcome of their investment, they also have input on which company specifically they invest in, um, which is a very different type of offering. So technically it's a fundless sponsor, but we don't really like to use that term um, because we you know, have the funds with our network, but they're not necessarily corralled in a bank account, so to speak. So it's more flexible for the investor. For the business owner, our pitch to them is twofold. First off, we don't have a time horizon on any investment hold. We don't want to hold it for 20 years, or maybe we do. But typically it's five to seven years, but a lot of times you can get to year four or five and the strategy that you've built up with the operator is just starting to click. And then before you know it, 12 months down the road, you have to think about selling might not necessarily be the best time for the business. So we don't have to worry about those constraints on, on a specific time, uh, investment time frame, if you will. Um, secondly, what we go to them and say is that it's not just us that is bringing the money to the table. We'll, and the term we use, uh, we, we didn't coin it, but it's entrepreneurial capital. So a lot of the high net worth individuals, a lot of the executives, a lot of the families have built businesses, sometimes two and three businesses. And they're looking to invest not only with us, but also with the people that we're investing in, the businesses that we're investing in. They want to come meet the operators. They want to have conversations with them. They want to help grow the business together with us. It's not just the money they're giving us. It's the knowledge that they've built up over the years that's made them successful that then they can pass on and reinvest, if you will, along with their money into the business owners and operators that we're looking to partner with. Gotcha. So when, when you're working with these types of we'll call them target companies, sure. who could be a potential portfolio company for you. Um, what about family dynamics? I imagine in a lot of these smaller businesses, there's probably family members who are involved in the business, may or may not be involved going forward. What, there, how does there, that play out? There are. Um, sometimes it's usually two or three, um, and you're talking about for the companies that we're looking yeah. at, correct? Yeah. Sometimes there's maybe two or three family members that are in the business. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's a very touchy subject sometimes. You've got to really tread softly with how different people are going to react to a change in ownership, to one of the family members leaving. Um, but actually, a, a, what we see more is, for example, you know, a $5 million revenue company that makes great cash flow has got one real lead executive, maybe two salespeople, and no real deep management team underneath them. And not because they haven't wanted to grow that management team, they just haven't had to. They've been the top salesperson, they've been the operations guy, they've been the CLO, they've been to an extent the CFO, right? They might have a controller or a bookkeeper, but they're playing all these roles. And when we come into these businesses, the one thing that we like to say is, even though you haven't built out this team over time, here's the capital and the resources to do so, number one. And secondly, it can be a very, you know, kind of scary process to try building out a team because the hardest thing, as these people know, is hiring people, I'm sorry, hiring people is the most difficult part of building a business, yeah. regardless of what you do, whether it's services, manufacturing, doesn't matter. H hardest part is finding good people. Um, building out the deep bench to allow that lead executive to not be caught up in the day-to-day -day or not have the day-to-day -day responsibilities of making the A to Z you know, pitch to his employees, they can then start thinking about strategy, start thinking about the future, start thinking about investment, start thinking about you know, what, 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 what is the black swan that might come along and how do I protect against that? Where they haven't had the time to think about that in years past because they've been so, not caught up, but they've been wearing so many hats because they just haven't felt either the need or the willingness to pass off some of those responsibilities. So almost going to them and say, yes, you should be comfortable with bringing in more people that can take some of this off your plate. Bring in a CFO at the right time, bring in a COO. Um, bring in somebody that can, that can run your warehouse uh, better. Bring in somebody uh, who might be a strategic board member. It could only be a three-person board. It might be us, the executive, and one other person. But that one person could make a world of difference in the investment um, and the partnership that we end up building. Yeah. So when I talk to some of my friends in the investment banking world and from personal experience in talking with business owners, one of the big things I hear all the time is, I, I, I don't think it's the right time for me to sell because I really don't know what I'm going to do if I sold the business. Um, there are probably folks out there in the audience right now who could be potential portfolio companies for you. What do you say to them if they're thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do if I sell my business? I would say twofold. First, we'd love to have a conversation with you um, because we're, we're actively looking for uh, both add-on acquisitions for our home medical uh, supplies distribution company, but also we're looking for more platform investments with our network of investors. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that should you decide to become uh, you know, basically a partner with us, uh, whether it's full liquidity, partial liquidity, 
Uh, more often than not, that's going to produce some wealth for you, your family, that you then need to reinvest elsewhere. Now, we're not looking for a $100,000, $200,000 check, but we would love to be able to partner with you, the executive whose business we just bought, in another company that we're looking at to buy, where then you can take your business acumen and help us grow that business with us. Gotcha. So similarly, there may be investors out there watching this right now and Absolutely. wondering, how do I get involved in this? Absolutely. We would lo love to see the compounding of business owners, almost business owners to sellers to then investors with us. Um, we, th we think it's a great cycle that we're trying to build out you know, over the next coming years, which is, you know, for example, the, the home medical business, we'd love to be able to get in contact with more executives that want to do just that, sell their business, but then also you know, tuck a m bunch of money away. Um, but then also look for, like you said, what's next? Because if you've started a company at, for example, 45, you built it for 15 years or 20 years, you know, people are living a lot longer. And at the end of the day, you're an entrepreneur. Your clock's not just going to stop like that. You're going to look for something to stimulate you intellectually and also be able to make money for the future. Um, and you don't just want to cut a blind check into a fund sometimes or just hand it off to your money manager. Not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but there is a big portion of we think entrepreneurs that want to do more and help and either sit on a board and not do a full-time job, but be able to take X amount of dollars and invest in three or four companies and, t and help them, help us help the executives grow the business um, and go from, like I said uh, before when we were talking, kind of 50 in the right lane to 90 in the left lane. Yeah. Getting that transition, um, adding that business acumen that you bring to the table along with the Rolodex and, and kind of the, the outside thinking that we like to think we bring, um, you can get that company from going here to here really quick. Very good. Uh, we have to take a very quick commercial break. We'll be right back with Behind the Numbers. Don't go away. RVN TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company's brand awareness. But what is your brand? According to Forbes, it's a combination of your logo, your product, your design and feel, and your personality. Did you know that aside from being a guest, we offer even more opportunity to boost your brand? Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine ad, you can leave our studio and within 48 hours have a permanent digital copy of your live segment to link to your social media, embed into your company website, or use in email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest. Welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder. My guest today is Thomas Lindbergh, and we're talking private equity. So this is a segment that we are going to call the money shot. This is where my guest gets to share their top tips and tricks, advice that they've learned throughout their business careers. So Thomas, we were talking at the break, so you're, you're a little bit prepared for this now. And a little bit. I'm you a little bit. But what are the, the most important things that you would share as your top tips? What's the money shot? I, I would say, you know, obviously for what we look for in, um, in a prospect, what makes a good prospect for us? Well, first off, it's, it's any business owner who's looking for a liquidity event or financial partner um, or growth investor. Obviously, we want to have a conversation with you. Secondly, if you're a wealthy individual, an executive, a business owner who's looking to deploy capital in the market that um, you know, we were just talking about in the micro end um, and have some tangible input on those investments and, and help grow the business, we obviously want to have a conversation with you too because we're constantly looking to grow our investor base. Uh, the more people that we end up knowing, the more investors that we can pull from, the more resources we can bring into business owners, the better off we can be. But where I would go with the money shot is I would say the third prospect, which to me is, is, is the best one, is the business owner that has a great company. They've built a great firm over time. They're employing 20, 30, 50 people, whatever. They're making great cash flow. Um, yeah, everything is going great. But they're going 50 in the right lane, the way that we view it. And the scary thing is, is that as a business owner, it's, it's pretty lonely at times, right? And you might have these great ideas and strategies and thoughts on how to grow your business, but number one, it might require some investment. Secondly, you bear all the risk as the business owner. And thirdly, you really don't, they haven't had anybody to sound check it with or, or to bounce the idea off. Um, 
they can be strategically lonely at times. And we want to have the conversation with that person because those ideas, those strategies, a lot of times are the ones that can get you really fast from going 50 in the right lane to 90 in the left lane. And we think we can bring the value of the entrepreneurial capital to the table, our Rolodex, our thoughts, our flexibility um, to partner with that business owner and bring in the resources and people to help us collectively get from here to here much faster. Um, so if you've been thinking about having a conversation with somebody, you've got a strategy you want to discuss, um, or you just want to bounce an idea off that you've got uh, business-wise, um, we'd love to have a cup of coffee or a conversation. Sounds good. Yeah. So Thomas, one more time for the folks that out there are looking sure. to contact you, how's their best way to get in touch with you? Uh, Lindbergh's pretty, our uh, email's pretty easy, tlindbergh at upstreamcapital.com. Um, phone number, I guess we can post up there as well, but LinkedIn, um, you know, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, please send me a message. We'd love to have a conversation with any and all people, business owners, uh, potential investors, and then the business owner out there that uh, kind of wants somebody to talk to and, and sanity check some of the ideas that could be game changing for their business and, uh, and uh, you know, the wealth that they're looking to generate for them and their families and employees. Very good. So to quick check with my producer. Do we have time to dive into another topic? I was getting a sign from you too. Okay, real quick. Sure. We're running out to the uh, the end of the program. Yeah. But if you could, in like 60 seconds. Sure. What, what's your your take on the the private in, private equity industry right now? What's the state of the industry? Um, I, first off, it's very strong. There's a lot of institutional capital uh, in the lower middle market and middle market um, chasing what seems like too few deals. Um, and like I said, I think the last frontier is the micro end of the market. You know, the $300,000 to $3 million VBITDA businesses that have got a lot of unsexy characteristics. They might not be in QuickBooks. They might not be operationally efficient. Um, you know, they could do some things, what seem to be, you know, heresy in some business practices. Not that, not that they're illegal, they're just very inefficient. Um, that turns off a lot of outside capital. Um, we think that's the last frontier and that's the best opportunity to make the best returns. Because the moment you start flipping on some of those operational light switches, then that gives you the ability to flip on the big strategy light switch. And once you do that, boom, you're off and running. Excellent. Well, hopefully you'll come back and, and finish this conversation. There's so much more that we can talk about. We'd love to. I feel like we, uh, we only scratched the surface. Yeah, well, we could do this for hours, obviously. Excellent. So thank you for watching Behind the Numbers. Today my guest was Thomas Lindbergh of Upstream Capital. See you next time.